there's something you're soaking in that makes you more likely to blow every good opportunity in your life. In this episode of Old School, we'll show you how to stack the deck so you can make better decisions. a closet in the hallway in our home that serves two purposes. One of those is to hold clean towels and sheets. How many of you guys have one of those closets in your house? It's a good idea. It's a lot better if they're folded and they're not just wadded up under the bed somewhere. That's how I did it back in high school. Sorry, mom. Um, I shouldn't have said hi, mom earlier. Now she's watching. But we keep towels there. And so whenever uh, the towel that I'm using starts to smell not fresh, I'll go and grab a new towel. And so that was our normal for a while. Well, several months ago, the towel that I was using was not fresh. So I went to the closet, I grabbed the new towel. I took a shower. I got done. I dried myself off. And you ever have this? I, I went, I smell worse now than before I got in the shower. What happened? The Cowboys fan problem, yeah, ha, ha. That's what happens. I give enough, it's going to come back. Not this time, at least. Uh, they may stink, but that didn't change my towel. Um, I, I got the towel, and I went, oh, this smells horrible. Somehow, a dirty towel got stacked with a clean one, so I went and got another towel from the same closet. The next time I took a shower, I also smelled bad. I smelled the next towel. The next towel stunk. And I've learned something that I should have figured out a lot earlier. See, the closet has two functions. One of them is to stack clean laundry. That's all in the racks about waist high and up. But the bottom of the hallway closet is the one collecting spot for all of the kids' dirty socks and underwear so that on laundry day, mom can collect them all and take them down to the laundry room. <laughs> Some of you guys have figured this out faster than I did. If you, it turns out if you put clean towels in an enclosed space with dirty socks, everything in the closet smells like socks. It's terrible. We had to rewash a whole batch of towels. It's a bummer. Okay? I wish it worked the other way around. I wish one downy fresh towel would just liven up the whole thing. It doesn't work that way. The room smells like socks. The towel smells like socks. Whatever environment something is in, it takes on the characteristics of that environment. And today I want to talk to you about the environment that you are immersed in without probably even realizing it. The, the, the atmosphere that you're just kind of floating in and how without you even being aware, the environment you're in is raising your odds of being an idiot. Okay? I don't want to be an idiot. You don't want to be a fool. How many would say, I don't know how many would say, Chris, my life would be happier today if I made a few better decisions 10 years ago. Anybody else? Yep. Okay. How many would say, I want to make better decisions today so that 10 years from now I have a better life? That's me. All right. We want to make some better decisions. I want to show you how God's wisdom uh, gives us a little peek into how you can stack the deck so that you can start making better decisions decisions. All right, we're going to do it by looking at a prime example of somebody who made some really poor decisions. He lived a long time ago, and his name was Rehoboam. Okay, we'll put the passages up on the screen. You can also get them on the Bible app. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, look for events, and you can actually follow along live and get all of that right there on your phone. Let me give you the quick backstory. Many of you guys are familiar with King David of Israel, uh, the David and Goliath guy, shepherd boy who becomes this great military leader. He united the 12 tribes of Israel into one kingdom. He's a great man. His son Solomon inherited the kingdom from dad and expanded it, did all of these huge building programs uh, and, uh, and became extremely wealthy. 
But in the process of doing all of this building stuff, he was really uh, taxing the country heavily. Everybody was exhausted and worn out from all of the stuff that Solomon was doing. And so it became time for Rehoboam, Solomon's son, uh, to inherit this amazing kingdom. And that's where we'll pick up 1 Kings chapter 12. We'll start in verse 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. How many Illinois residents can relate to harsh taxes? Okay, just talking to one of my neighbors and, and uh, like, man, they, they keep going on taxes. I'm going to be paying more for taxes than for the house itself. Okay, these guys could relate. So they tell the king, please lighten the tax load. We will be happy to serve you, but you got to give us a break. Rehoboam replied, give me three days to think this over and then come back for my answer. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father Solomon. What's your advice, he asked. And the older counselors replied, if you're willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. But Rehoboam also asked the opinion of the young men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. Well, what's your advice, he asked them. And the young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. Tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Now, that is a weird statement. All right, let me unpack this for you. Okay, you ready to get awkward in church? Sometimes the Bible translates things kind of loosely uh, that might be offensive to your sensibilities. Here, literally, what he's saying is, my little finger is bigger than dad's man stuff. All right? This is what the young men were advising him to tell the nation. I'm more of a man than my daddy. Look at this. Okay? Here's what you should tell them. Tell them I'm twice the man that my father was. Yes, verse 11, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Now, how many people with a heavy tax burden would like to vote for that guy? Here's my platform for peaking. Triple the taxes. Vote for me. I don't want anything to do with that guy. So he has, he has two different possibilities. Old guys say, you need to lighten it up, man. Be kind to the people and they'll follow you. Young guys say, are you kidding? You're the king, man. You make them do what you want them to do. Now, we're here separated by thousands of years and, uh, and the knowledge of kind of knowing how the story pans out. How many say old guy plan sounds like a better idea? How many say young guy plan sounds like a better idea? No. Okay, two of you guys. They're both related to me. Great. Ah, let's see what he does, all right? Verse 12, three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors, and he followed the counsel of his younger advisors, he didn't say the whole, uh, I'm bigger than dad's genitalia part, but he did tell the people, he did, he's like, oh, I like that, I'm going to whip you with scorpions thing. So he uses that in a public address. You think dad was harsh? This is going to be insane. Unsurprisingly, verse 16, when all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded, back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. And they say David to mean the family of David, the descendants of David. This is King David's grandson. And they're like, forget you, man. And to this day, and that's the day of the writing of this, the northern tribes of Israel have refused to be ruled by any descendant of David. Just... Let that sink in for a minute. You want to talk about somebody who had a golden opportunity and totally blew it. This guy inherited the nation of Israel at its absolute peak 
wealthiest it had ever been, the largest the boundaries of the nation in history have ever been. And this guy, all he has to do is be a wise leader. And instead, he becomes a fool. And uh, in, in the words of the great theologian Bugs Bunny, he was a maroon. Okay, do we have that? What a dope. What a maroon, right? Stupid. How stupid. Why would you do this? Okay, all of us listening to both pieces of advice can figure out what the man should have done. Why did he listen to the young guys? Let me show you that same towel soaking in the dirty sock closet. This is how. Okay, 1 Kings 12, verse 8. We read this earlier, but let me highlight for you. He listened to the young men who had grown up with him. See, this guy lived with a silver spoon in his mouth. This guy was part of the 1%. This guy was part of the super elite that had trouble relating to the common man. And his buddies, the young men who grew up with him, were also part of the elite, part of the people who didn't relate to the common man. And, and the old guys had a better plan. But eh, they're old. They don't know what they're talking about. I want to do what these guys, these are my buddies, they get it, they know what the next generation needs, and he listens to the people that he hung out with. And there's a powerful dynamic that he ignored. It's something that I didn't realize with the towel. It's something that I want you to learn without learning it the hard way. And some of you have learned this the hard way. But maybe we can avoid some bad things. I want you to write this down. This is our theme for the day. If you hang out with stupid people, you will make stupid decisions. If you hang out with stupid people, you're going to end up making stupid decisions because stupid is contagious. It just swells up the whole room wherever you are. And you'll end up making foolish, poor bad decisions, you'll end up wrecking wonderful golden opportunities right in front of you, and you may not even realize why. You're like, I'm just doing what I should, I'm just doing what's normal. I don't see the problem. And that is the problem, that you don't see it. The Bible says it very succinctly, Proverbs 13, 20, if you make friends with stupid people, you will be ruined. Now, don't unfriend anybody during this sermon. Okay, because they will know. <laughs> Just wait until later. But if, if, you make, if you make friends with stupid people, you will be ruined. Here's, here's how that works, okay? You were designed, I was designed by God to be a social creature, okay? We, we need community around us. We need friends. Some of you know what it's like to be lonely, and that stinks. It's because you aren't designed to be alone. We were designed to sort of coalesce into tribes. And through all human history, it was people who were accepted by their, their peers, people who were accepted by the tribe, who survived. It was the people who were accepted by their tribe that when their crop failed, their neighbor who cared about them had crop and they shared until they got back on their feet. Okay? It was the people who had a village around them that when the bandits came, they could all together repel the bandits. There's a, there's a deep need in you to be accepted by your peers. And that can work for good or for evil. And here's, here's where this thing can work against you, all right? The, the people that you hang out with the most, that acceptance, that drive for acceptance that makes you want to conform so that you're all together, that tends to define what normal is. Okay, you realize there are different normals in our world. You go to different countries. I love watching the Olympics and different languages and different cultures and different hairstyles and, and all of these different things. Okay, and write this down in your notes. Okay, your idea of normal is shaped by the people around you. And so that means if you hang out with people, their normal becomes your normal. And that becomes a problem if you primarily hang out with broke people. Okay? Because here's what happens. Yeah, you're like, I'm one. Okay? If you, primarily, if you primarily hang out with broke people, then bankruptcy is normal. 
having to rotate credit cards so that they don't catch up with you and just accumulating more and more debt and saying, I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of this. That, that's normal if you hang out with broke people. If you, hang out with, if you hang out with people who have no value of marriage, then you will not value marriage. If your peer group says, if, if things are getting rocky, you need to go find a different person. If you hang out with everybody and normal is having to share your kids with two different exes every Christmas, then that, well, that's just doing what's normal. Okay? If you, if you hang out primarily with a bunch of womanizers and porn indulgers, then objectifying women becomes normal. If you hang out with a bunch of people who, I'm not gossiping, I'm just saying, then just saying becomes normal. The people you hang out with, that sets your idea of what normal is. And so, without even being aware of it, this drive from God to say, you need to be accepted so you have friends, will cause you to adapt to the normal of the people that you're around. Here's the problem with that normal. I I don't want to be broke. I don't want to be divorced. I don't want to look at women as objects. I don't want to talk about people behind their back and share stories that destroy their reputations. I don't want to become so uh, so politically extreme that I can't even read the news without my heart rate going through the roof. I don't want to be that. But if I stay immersed in that, that's normal for me. Write this down in your notes. Normal is broken. Be weird. Sometimes you need to be a little bit weird. If normal is broken, then it's wise to be weird. How many know some Christians who are a little bit weird? Okay? A little bit of weird goes a long way, okay? (laughs) So I know some really weird Christians. I'm not saying you have to be like total kooky, but, but if you realize that normal in society is not what I want, If you realize that normal is to abuse this this abundance of food that we have so much that I destroy my body because I overindulge in something good, maybe I don't want to be normal. Maybe I want to be weird if weird is healthier. And normal is going to make it hard for you to make good decisions, like it did for the king who had great advisors, and he didn't listen to them. He hung out with guys who said, oh, they're a bunch of complainers, and that's what he did. So if you want to make better decisions, I want to give you a couple of things. You can start this week. You could start doing them today, and they will help you to make better decisions and not to have your decisions subconsciously influenced by stupid people around you. Three things you can do. First one is this. Write this down. You need to limit your exposure to broken normals. You need to limit your exposure to broken normals. If you realize all of my friends are dating guys that are kind of abusive and they all take advantage of them and they all want all of the sex and none of the commitment, maybe you should not hang out with those friends as much. Because what they're telling you is, this is just what men do. That's not what men should do. You shouldn't have to settle for that. If you find yourself in a group where normal is not what you want and normal is broken, you need to limit your exposure. Now, I did not say you need to go live in a commune somewhere. Okay? I'd be willing to bet even the Amish folks have some broken normals. Okay? It's not retreat from society completely, but you do need to limit your exposure. Listen to the wisdom in Psalm 1 1. The Bible says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Okay? There's blessing when you don't linger in the sock closet so long that you start to smell. Okay? This does not mean you can't have friends. How are you supposed to share the love of Jesus with someone who doesn't know if you don't have friends that aren't saved? I'm not saying that, but you got to limit those times. Okay? There may be some of those times 
when the guys are saying, hey, we're all going to go out to Hooters after work and grab some drinks, that's a good time to say, I, we're friends, we work together, but thank you for the invitation, I'll pass. Because I don't want to look at women that way. I don't want to see myself when I've had four or five beers and know, who tell me what I might do, okay? A thanks, but no thanks. When you're walking to the break room and you see that cluster of people and they're held all around and they're talking about who's probably going to get fired and who's going to get advanced and who's cheating on who, I'm just going to, you guys go ahead and have your, I'm just going to go back here and have lunch by myself. I'm just going to step away. Some of you, you need to turn off the shouting heads on TV every once in a while because you can't, You can't even look at things without your blood pressure going through the roof. I've been there. I I don't want that to be normal. Some of you, you just need to stop scrolling because all the relationship advice, okay, I'm a a Reddit fan. I love because all of my nerddoms have their own like little tribes, PC gamers and Dallas Cowboys and all of these, okay? Let me tell you, the relationship advice on Reddit is deplorable. It's horrible. Okay, and if scroll, 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 I don't, I don't want that. You got you to gotta limit your exposure to that. Sometimes you can't get away from someone who's a bad influence. I understand. Some of you are like, look, the problem is my older brother, and he and I share a room. I can't get away. The problem is this coworker that I'm in the cubicle with or, or these people in my, in my class. You, you may just need to create some boundaries and say, look, we're, we can be friends, but... I'm not going to talk about this with you. I'm not going to do that thing with you. you. You've got to set some boundaries. Okay, you've got to make some space. So the first thing you need to do is limit your exposure to broken normals. Here's number two. If you want to make better decisions, if you want to not be a maroon, you need to find wise people and spend time with them. Okay? This is not rocket science, but my gosh, we just don't do this. So we do need a reminder sometimes, if you want to be wise, if you want to make better decisions, you need to find wise people and spend time with them. Okay, earlier we read Proverbs 13, 20. We read the second half of the verse. Let me give you the first half of the verse. The Bible says this, keep company with the wise and you will become wise. If you hang out with smart people, you'll tend to become a little bit smarter in the way that you do things. If you hang out with those people, you'll become wise. And I want you to notice this is different than ask somebody for advice. Okay? It is great to ask wise people for advice, but that's not the same dynamic. Okay? Go back to our story. Rehoboam asked the old guys for advice. But he followed the advice of the people that he spent time with because they were the ones who determined what normal is. Okay, Their normal was these ants of people are here to support us, the 1% elites. And they completely, they went completely tone deaf to the culture around them. That was a really toxic normal that lost the guy the best opportunity he'd ever had in his life. So some of you, you need, to, you need to intentionally spend time with wise people. If, if your kids, if you're like, dude, I've thrown up my arms. I don't know what to do with these kids. They're wild. You need to find somebody whose kids are well-behaved or who has raised some children, and you need to just spend some time with them so that you can learn some of this stuff, how they go about it. If you're having trouble in your marriage, you need to find a couple that's been married for 25 years and still like each other. And then you need to go on a double date with them and just hang out and say, Jerry, Peggy, how, how do you guys stay together for so long? Okay, You need to actively do those things. It's, it's normal's therapy. It's helping you because here's, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Okay, If 75% of your coworkers decide we want to be healthy. And every lunch when they're all going out, they're all going out to grab a salad and then they're going to hit, instead of the bar after work, they're hitting the gym after work. And they're like, hey man, you want to come work out with me, Jennifer? Why don't we just go together? We'll do it together. What happens? Normal becomes, hey, I only get one body. I should probably take care of it. I need to make this healthy. And now that drive to be accepted is driving you to make better decisions. 
You got to spend time with wise people. So limit your exposure to broken normals. All right. You need to seek out wise people, spend time with them. And finally, this is the most important piece. Okay. If you don't, don't put it up yet. Hang on. If you don't do this, if you don't do this piece, I don't think that you will successfully get the other ones. This is the most important part of it all. Okay. Put that up. You need to ask God for help and then listen on all channels, all avenues. God, I need you to help me to make better decisions. And then you need to listen for all of the different ways that that wisdom can come into your life. I thought about this as I studied this and I, I read this a while ago and I thought, man, this is good. I need to teach this. Okay. So Rehoboam had this huge decision, and, and Mark, you can go ahead and come back up. Rehoboam had the biggest decision of his life, and he knew it was big when he said, I need you to give me three days before I come up with an answer. He knew this is the most vital, crucial decision of my life. He asked the old guys, he asked his buddies, do you notice who he didn't ask for wisdom? God. Never once is the king recorded as saying, bring the prophet and inquire of the Lord for me. Never once does he go and bow before God like his grandfather did and say, God, tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. Never once. And it's no wonder that he picked bad advice. If you want to make better decisions, you need God's help because some of you, you're hearing this and you're like, Chris, I hear what you're saying, but listen, there are a lot of different opinions on how to raise your kids and I don't know which one's right. There are a lot of different opinions on how to organize your finances. I don't know which one's right. I, I've got multiple job opportunities and one's going to have me working this shift and one's going to have me working this. I don't know which one is right. And you need the Holy Spirit to come along with a highlighter and go, this one, this one. Okay? You need that. And, he, and the good news is God wants you to have wisdom. He wants you to get it right. I love this passage, James chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He wants you to have it. I, I love how James specifically says, ask our generous God. He, he's not being stingy with wisdom. Young people, God wants you to make good decisions now so that 10 years from now, you're not raising your hand in church saying, boy, I wish I would have paid more attention in high school. I wish I wouldn't have married that guy. I wish I wouldn't have quit my job. I wish I would have stayed in school, whatever it is. God wants you to be wise. He has wisdom for you, but you've got to ask him and then listen on all channels. So here's my experience. Okay? Take it or leave it. This is just 41 years being a Christian. Here's my experience. Most of the time, when I ask God for wisdom, most of the time, he does not respond in a dream for me. He usually doesn't respond by speaking to me. I've never heard the audible voice of God. He usually doesn't respond by causing a passage from the Bible to like start glowing and my phone starts by. Most of the time when I say, God, I need wisdom, he responds by putting wise people in my life and having them speak God's wisdom to me. And if I say, God, Tell me what to do. If I said, God, I don't know if I should marry this person or not. Tell me what to do. And then I completely cut myself off from wise people around me. I'm not giving him much of a chance to respond. He's like, Chris, I got wisdom all around you. Why don't you listen? So we mentioned it earlier. Our, our small groups are resuming in a couple of weeks. You need people around you who have a worldview that says, my life is surrendered to God and I do things his way. You need that to be normal. You, you need to spend some time with people who love each other and are committed to marriage. You need to spend time with some people who are committed to putting God first in their finances and then being wise with what they have. You need that influence in your life. 
And you got to seek that out. And if you ask God for wisdom, he will help you to not be an idiot. He will help you to be wise. But if you say, God, give me wisdom, and then you go right back to the sock closet, it's not doing any good. You got to pray, but you got to also take action. God expects you to listen to the wisdom that he wrote in the book. That's for you. I'll end with this. This is, in my mind, this is a tragic, ironic truth that you may not have realized. So Rehoboam has the most vital decision of his life. And he completely ignores this biblical wisdom that we read thousands of years later. Proverbs 13, 20. If you hang out with stupid people, you'll be ruined. If you hang out with wise people, you'll become wise. Do you know who wrote that passage into the Bible? It was his dad. His dad was the one who wrote it. And I can't help but think that at some point in Solomon's life, as he's aging, he's realizing, I built this whole kingdom, and it's going to be up to my son. And I believe he saw, now I don't know for sure, but I believe when he wrote this, because he addressed a lot of this to his son. I believe he wrote this down, looking and saying, son, if you keep hanging out with these knuckleheads, you're going to blow it. You need to spend time with wise people. And his own son blew the biggest opportunity of his life. I don't want that to happen to you. Okay? Whoever finds, the Bible says, whoever finds a wife is blessed, finds a blessing from the Lord. The Bible says children are a gift from God. Some of you have amazing opportunities. And if you hang out with stupid people who have broken values, you'll blow it. And I don't want you to blow it. You got to spend time with wise people. You have to give distance between broken normals. You can't step out of the world. But listen, Christ did not hang on the cross and suffer for your sins. He didn't come back from the grave so that you could have the Holy Spirit empowering you to be normal. He did that so that you didn't have to be normal, so that you could be something different, something better. So don't just accept normal around you. Be better. Be weird. Be wise. Hey there, just wanted to take a minute to say thanks for watching. If a friend sent you this link, it's because they believe what we talked about today is going to make a positive impact in your life. And if it did, there's probably somebody that you care about who could benefit from it. So take a minute to share this video with somebody. Post it to your timeline or send them a direct link. And if you're able, take a minute to give using the link at the bottom of the description on this video. One last thing. Maybe you feel a tug at your soul and you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual life and form a relationship with God. We've got folks here who would love to talk with you about it. So just text prayer to the number on your screen and we'll follow up with you. It's also in the description on this video in case that helps. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.